Uh, well, first I want to thank Gary, Greg, and the Stimson Center, and especially uh, Deborah for uh, the great idea and all the hard work uh, to put in place this uh, student essay contest on 1540. Of course, the primary responsibility for dealing with weapons of mass destruction rests with governments. But governments need public awareness and support in order to be effective. And we rely on uh, the work of, uh, of informed citizens, including the students who participated in this contest, to generate fresh and cogent ideas to help guide government action. And as somebody who's coming to the end of his career and thinking about retirement, it's great to see so many young people who will uh, fill in and continue to work on this issue, which I agree with Gary, Greg is likely to be with us for a very long time. So we have two uh, keynote speakers today, one of uh, whom is uh, held up by the gods of travel, so hopefully he'll arrive in time to speak. But we'll proceed with our first uh, keynote speaker, who's one of those government officials who is critical to the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1540. And that's the representative of Spain um, to the UN, um, who is Ambassador um, Oyarzun. He chairs the 1540 Committee to the UN Security Council. Uh, and as such, Ambassador Oyarzun is responsible for the comprehensive review of 1540, which will propose a plan of action to the UN Security by the end of the year to strengthen the implementation and the administration of 1540, including, we hope, greater resources may be the one key um, element to strengthening 1540. And with his reputation for hard work and diplomatic skills, I'm quite confident uh, that the ambassador will uh, drive the comprehensive review to a successful conclusion. Welcome, Ambassador. The world today is a challenging one. On August 21st, 2015, ISIL shed the student city of Maria with artery shells filled with mustard gas. Victims had no shelter, as there is no escape from polluted air. They had no way of assessing the damage either. They had to wait for days for the horrifying consequences of mustard gas to appear. First, the breathing difficulties then the blisters, then the swollen eyes, the fever. Not even a month ago, on September 9th, North Korea defied the international community once again, conducting the fifth nuclear test in its history. Kim Jong, reckless regime, withdrew from the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 2003 and has ever since advance its nuclear and ballistic missile program. Nuclear weapons are the deadliest legacy of the Cold War. Today, the persistence of nuclear arsenals around the world is faced with a new challenge, the development of technology. Non-state actors, determined as they are to acquire nuclear weapons, enjoy an infinite landscape of opportunities. They can breach the security of nuclear facilities through cyber attacks. They can learn how to build a nuclear bomb online. They can finance their activities in untraceable ways. Make no mistake, it only takes one nuclear attack to wipe out the entire country. The threat, distinguished audience, students, is a real one. I'm going to say something that it's going to shock you. I am very optimistic. I am very optimistic about the future. If the threat of proliferation is increasing, so are the means to counter it. If non-state actors are more determined than ever in their endeavor, so are we. I am not naive. I know we have the tools and that we will succeed. We have the United Nations Resolution 1514 aimed at preventing non-state actors from acquiring 
weapons of mass destruction. Let me very briefly explain what Resolution 1540 is about. First, it established a series of legally binding obligations for all member states have to enforce. Under Resolution 1540, states must prohibit all proliferation activities. And most importantly, they have to enforce measures that guarantee that legitimate activities are not used for purpose of proliferation. Further, Resolution 1540 presents all member states with the opportunity of seeking or providing assistance to other states. That way, those states with better resources can assist others in assessing their risk and drafting legislation. Since its adoption, and I was in the Security Council in 2004, the resolution was succeeded to prevent a large-scale attack by non-state actors. But work remains to be done. As we mark the 12th anniversary of the text, the Security Council is engaged in making it fit for purpose again. And I have people here around in this room that are working 24-7 on that purpose. I can see Javier, he works uh, with me 24-7. I see Terry, and I see young experts as well. So, during this year, we have made an assessment of the new challenges before us. We have also taken stock of the successes and the failures of the resolution. Now, I am pleased to say, we are ready to update it to the current environment. For that, although my notes do not say it, I will be needing to meet the consensus of the 15 members of the Security Council. And that's going to be the real, real challenge. We have been preparing this work for, well, since I entered into council, since Bain joined the council. And the review process has been prepared very, very carefully. But we have to negotiate day and night in the next 60 days because our intention is to adopt the review in the first or second week of December when Spain presides the Council. But which is our tool? We have youth, we have you, the students, to stay. I stand in front of you, I stand in front of hungry and bright students, and I want to be ready to take the lead and raise the grim picture I presented at the beginning of my speech. I am confident that you will do it. Let me tell you something to the students. Previous generations had the choice to take responsibility to make the world a safer place, or to turn a blind eye on the world's problems. You don't. Threats are global. Terrorism is global. A nuclear attack would be global. So your choice today is a very different one. You can choose to be cynical about the future and simply assume that a world threatened by weapons of mass destruction is what we are in for. Or you can choose to fight global threats. If I want one message to resonate today with you is this one. To those who say catastrophe is inevitable, to those who resign to chemical warfare as the new norm, you have to say, it is not. I can't imagine how many times a day you hear that you are the leaders of tomorrow. And I hate to be the bearer of the bad news. You hear that, it is true. But please, don't wait to be world leaders to take action. Do it today. Do it by promoting a culture of security, by taking seriously the country's institutions, by understanding that regulation is not here to burden you, but to burden the bad guys, by not allowing corruption at the small scale, because that will only lead to corruption at a larger scale. Do it countering terrorist narrative online. Some of you, have already taken action, and I'm proud of it. I have read some of the essays that were submitted to the contest, and I'm truly impressed. 
your innovative thinking is the kind of thing that we definitely need. Fresh ideas. I'm sure that some of your ideas will be included in 1540 committee's discussions. I'm totally sure. Because what we're doing in the review process is to try to incorporate in all of our analysis civil society, think tanks, because we feel that World Security Council experts are very good, but you need to learn from the others. And if you have a world of think tanks, if you have a world of a uh, prestigious university as this one. I have to recognize that I'm impressed speaking in Harvard. If you ha have all that, you have to benefit from all that and to incorporate in the re review process all that rich, rich knowledge. So I want to end my remarks thanking the Stimson Center for such necessary initiative and to all the participants in the contest. Thank you very much, you all, for listening and uh, now, if you allow me, we are going to proceed with the announcement and presentation of uh, winners. It is going to the announcement of the three papers awarded honorable mention. The first one is for a 1540 implementation plan for the Russian Federation. And this one goes to Mr. Adrián Alvarado. Adrián is a PhD candidate from Mexico City and uh, resides in Paris, France. He is pursuing a doctoral degree at the University of Lyon. So, Adrián, a big applause. For a 1540 implementation plan for Qatar, Mr. Landon Elliott Poe and Ms. Trulli, sorry about the pronunciation, Rajeswari. Landon was a cadet at the Citadel Military College of South Carolina and will be pursuing a master's degree in the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Sri will be pursuing her third and final year at the University of Cambridge this fall. They will, they will be joining us later by WebEx. They're in Cambridge. By WebEx, very okay. good. For an implementation plan for Turkmenistan, Ms. Hannah Rifkin. Hannah is a senior at uh, Bryn Mawr College in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Adrian and Hannah will if you will come up to receive your, your award. And I see an, an envelope as well. It is the announcement of uh, the winner of the second place. And it's for the 1540 implementation plan for the United States. And this is Ms. Kyle Piluti. Kyle is a graduate student in non-proliferation and terrorism studies at Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterrey in Monterrey, California. So if you can approach with a big applause by the audience. the winner of the first place, and it's for his 1540 implementation plan for Tunisia, Mr. Enrique de Vega Gonzalez. I pronounced this very well. <laughs> <laughs> Enrique is a master's degree student from Plasencia, Spain, and currently resides in Madrid, my city. He is pursuing a master's degree in peace, security, and defense at the Gutierrez Mellado Institute. So, uh, Enrique, if you can approach with a big applause by the audience. 